The lesson from the Old Testament for this morning is found in Proverbs 3, verses 1 through 12, found on page 455 in the Old Testament of your few Bibles. Listen for the word of God. My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commandments in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourish to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with a new wine. My son, do not despise the Lord's disciple or discipline and do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves as, as a father, the son he delights in. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you Allelu Alleluia Ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be added unto you. Allelu, Allelu. O oh Lord, open our eyes, open our ears, and open our hearts to what your word has to say to us. Help us to live into the words that you give to us so that we may enjoy life and prosperity as you intend it. Now strengthen my words, for mine are empty and you hold the very words of life. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be holy and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. January 15th, 2009 began like any other day, people coming and going to work. And one man went to work expecting any other day. But that was not destined to be any other day in New York City, and of course we're not talking about September 11th, we're talking about January 15th. But that was the day that US, Air's, U.S. Airways Flight 1549 took off from LaGuardia Airport and immediately hit a flock of Canada geese knocking out both engines in the Boeing 737. And in a split second, an ordinary morning turned into an extraordinary day. As uh, Chesney, or as he's known, Sully Sullenberger, made the split second decision to ditch US Airways Flight 1549 in the Hudson River. You may recall the, the news story around that. That was quite a feat. 
an impressive display of piloting. Well, when you, when you look at the, the history, or excuse me, the, the experience of Sully, it's not too much of a surprise. He had been at aviation for nearly 40 years. He had been 10 years in the Air Force and nearly 30 years with U.S. Airways. Sully was a, uh, a gliding instructor and knew how to fly a plane every which way. And so on that morning of the 15th, when he had no engines, 40 years of experience and nearly 20,000 hours of flight experience kicked in. He later commented that he had, it's like he had been making small deposits in the bank of experience for years upon years, so much so that when the moment came, he could make one very large withdrawal. And that is a wonderful story to remind us of how God's commands are supposed to be. Sully operated out of his core. He operated out of his experience. There is no doubt that he was not fumbling for controls. He was not fumbling for switches. What he did came from his heart, from his very core, because he was practiced. And God's commands are to be at the core of God's people as well, as Solomon writes here. We open to verse 1 and verse 3, although I will acknowledge that uh, verse 5 is kind of what overshadows everything else. But let me suggest to you, 1 and 3 are actually what this section is all about. My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Solomon wants it to be known that wisdom is something that's to be held close. It's something that's not to be forgotten. Wisdom isn't an add-on to our life, but it's something to be at our very core. And he uses imagery that would have been familiar to his day. We're familiar with the, the image of things being in our heart being very, very close to us, something that's, that's instilled deep within us. But he also uses the image of bind it around your, your neck. And we go, well, that kind of sounds like an ornament. That sounds like an add-on because that's not something that comes from deep within but in Hebrew anthropology, in the, in the Hebrew way of understanding the body, the neck was the source of life. And it makes sense. It's where we can feel the breath going in and the breath going out. And if we don't feel that anymore, well, we're not feeling much then. And so we can understand why the Hebrews would understand it this way. So when he says, when Solomon says, bind them around your neck, he says, keep it close to your very life. Let love and faithfulness be always around you. Keep my commands in your heart. Write them on the tablet of your heart. We don't need much of a cultural translation to understand what he's saying. But as I said to the kids, this is not just outward actions, is it? When we read this, when we see bind them, to, bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart, we see that God is not just concerned about our actions. Too often times when we hear the command of God, when we hear the law, we hear do this, do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this, really don't do that. And more times than not, all we hear are the do not, do not, do not, really don't, do not. We equate it with the things that we are and aren't allowed to do in any given situation, our outward actions. But when Solomon says, keep my commands in your heart, Write them on the tablet of your heart. Keep them around the very center of your life. 
we understand that what Solomon is saying is not simply about actions, but it's about our internal dispositions as well, our attitudes, our understandings of the world, and our understandings of who we are. Solomon gives a result for keeping these close, verses 2 and 4, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and of man. It talks about peace and prosperity, but let me suggest that this is not talking solely about wealth. I think when we hear that, we have a natural tendency to think, oh, here comes some wealth, health and wealth gospel. Does this mean that I'm going to, you know, believe in God and I'm going to hit the lottery tomorrow? No. No, because the word that's under there isn't about material wealth. The word that's under there is one that you might be familiar with, one that you might have heard of before, shalom. The Hebrew word for peace. But to translate it just as peace would be to say that the Grand Canyon is a big hole in the ground. It kind of misses the depth of the word and the, the breadth of the word. Because shalom was not just about peace, it was about wholeness, it was about harmony. Things acting the way they should. All of creation working in harmony as it was created to be. That's what's beneath that word. And so when it says prosperity, it doesn't have in mind our sense of prosperity, of being able to pay all the bills and have a little extra left over to go to the movies. What it means is wholeness. Health in every aspect of our lives. Not just economic, not just our physical health, but our relational health, our emotional health, our mental health, our spiritual health. Wholeness on every level. Wholeness that goes to every aspect of our being. That's the peace and prosperity that Solomon talks about. And when we think about it that way, it's not hard to imagine that obeying the command of God brings us peace and prosperity in the sense of shalom. As well, we can get thrown off by the translation, we can win favor and a good name. Solomon's not talking about renown or fame, and Solomon was someone who was familiar with fame. He had wealth, he had wisdom. His court was known in the ancient Near East. But what he he actually says here is, then you will fa win favor and a good understanding in the eyes of God. One of the things as a teacher, as an elementary school teacher, uh, would understand is that there are a number of kids who want to win the teacher's approval. They will work for the teacher's approval. I taught seniors in high school and I taught Beowulf. I am not familiar with this concept, just to let you know. But I do understand, I do have an eight-year-old and a four-year-old, and I do understand that they want the approval of mom and dad, and that they will work for this. They want a good understanding in the sight of mom and dad. And just as well, we can see here that what Solomon is saying is not fame or renown or glory for oneself, but it is good understanding in the eyes of God. If we want approval from our parents, how much would it mean to us to have approval of our understanding of the world in the sight of God? For God to say, yes, you get it. That's an amazing thought. To be considered by God as someone who understands the world. Someone who understands how the world works and what good and evil and what harmonious things are. What peace is, what shalom is. That's the good name Solomon's talking about. Someone who is wise 
in the sight of God and in the sight of the world. That's what's in view here. That's the result he's talking about. And we can see that Solomon is far more concerned about a bigger picture than he is about our understanding of prosperity and of repute. Well, okay, James, that sounds nice, but that once again, like last week, that's a bit general. You have given us a great general command without a lot of specifics, going back to that idea of clean your room or clean the kitchen. It's a very straightforward statement with a very, very broad meaning. How does that ju differ from just being a good person? Well, Solomon gives three different examples here. The first is in verses 5 through 8, a verse that I think a lot of us may be familiar with. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. In all your ways acknowledge him. Acknowledge him. Last week we talked about Psalm 107 and there's a phrase in Psalm 107 that is familiar to church people but largely means nothing. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. That was last week and I, I said that, that's a great statement that we all know that we have no idea what it means. And here this week, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding in all your ways, acknowledge him. Perhaps a better way to translate that, in all your ways acknowledge him, uh, is not the sense of going down the street and, hi God, and continuing on your way. But more literally here, what it, it, Solomon says is, in all your ways, desire his presence. In everything that you do, desire his presence. Desire God's presence in, in the things that, that you do well. Desire God's presence in the things that you don't do so well. Desire God's presence in the areas of your life where you're embarrassed. Desire God's presence in all aspects of living when you're proud and in areas that you don't even think about. The other way that Solomon says this is, don't be wise in your own eyes. Desire God's presence in your thought life as well as your actions once again. Rely on God. Desire his presence in every aspect of life. In everything that we do, desire God to be present. But he gives a second example in 9 through 10. He talks about recognizing the source of our gifts. On the surface, uh, this reads a bit like, if I do this, then I will get that. He says, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. Or perhaps we could simply say our bank accounts will overflow more modern understanding of, of, of what we might be thinking there. But what he is saying, this is not a section that is to talk about, if I do this, then I will get this. That sort of understanding of God is an elder brother sort of understanding of God. And what I mean by that is in Luke 15, the parable of the prodigals. There are two prodigal sons in that and a prodigal uh, father. That's another sermon. Um, we'll just put that over here and not worry about it for the moment. But the elder son, the elder prodigal, wanted the father, but he wanted the father for everything the father could give to him. He wanted the father for his stuff, for his estate, not simply to be in the father's presence. And this verse is not that sort of understanding that if you do this, then you'll get this out of God. But it's a recognition of where our gifts come from, where our wealth, where everything we have comes from, our gifts. And we, when we recognize the source of our gifts 
and when we recognize the giver himself, then our giving becomes what it's meant to be, an act of worship, an act of response to God's grace in our lives. That's what's in view here. Not an if-then to get things, but an understanding of where things come from and where our praise goes. Well, finally, he gives a, an example of about understanding discipline as love in verses 11 to 12. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. I think there are quite a number of people who enjoy going off to college because, of course, there's a bit less structure and a bit less watchfulness, let's say. There's a bit more being able to do and to come and go as you please. Now, I didn't experience this quite as much because I was a third child and mom was tired. So, uh, first and second children, this is your verse right here. Understanding the Lord's discipline. Because we do, as we get older, we say, I can make my own decisions. I was at High V the other night and it was, I was coming back from something. It was 11 p.m. And I knew I needed to pick up milk and I needed to pick up some other things for dinner uh, the following night, things that were healthy. And I thought, I'm going to the candy aisle. <laughs> and mercy, I can do this. I can walk there and no one is going to say a thing. They're going to take my money just the same. We do. We get older and we, we feel the freedom. But what this verse reminds us is that God still wants to move us somewhere. There's a, a bit of common wisdom that says that God loves you where you are. And that's true, but not entirely. Because as parents, we love our children as they are, but we don't leave them there, do we? Toilet training is not just an act of self-preservation on the parents' part. It's something to move your child forward, to teach them independence. And we teach our, chi our children to do things on their own, to, to have a sense of internal discipline, to have a sense of right and of wrong, to have a sense of how the world works. And what we find in these verses is that God looks at us the same way. God does love us where we are. But God is wanting us to move closer to something. And what we find through the scripture is that God is moving us towards the likeness of himself, of Jesus Christ, of God's understanding of the world. That should be a reassuring thing. Uh, many people have trouble with computers. And one thing that can be helpful is to have someone who has built and designed computers there to help you understand how they operate. When you have the creator, the created thing becomes more knowable. And when we look at these verses, don't despise the Lord's discipline. We can see that as a gift from the creator looking at the created thing. Because if it were true that God loves us just the way we are and that was it, why would he call Abram, Abraham, why would God call the Israelites? Why would God send prophets for hundreds and hundreds of years to call God's people back to himself? And why, oh why, would God send his only son? God disciplines those he loves. And when God corrects error, either action, error in action, or error in thought, it's an act of love not an act of retribution. It's like military training. 
military training prepares soldiers for what's to come. It doesn't correct what's in their past. The drill sergeant doesn't care about what's in someone's past. The drill sergeant cares about preparing them for what is to come. That's not retribution. That's dis discipline. That's an idea of what God's correction in our lives looks like. So I'm sorry, older children and younger children, we have some, still have some discipline that can be enacted. But as we practice these actions, and as we practice these attitudes, and as we sense God bringing us correction, we will put more and more of God's commands, God's wisdom, at our core, where it's supposed to be reflecting God's glory and God's likeness. Let's pray. Lord, help us to be more like you. Help us as hard as it is at times to seek your discipline, to be corrected, to be brought into your understanding. So that we don't lean on ours, but we seek your presence in every aspect of our lives. Find this word to our hearts that we may live by faith. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.